Uh, hey, Mike, man. Hey, Russ, how's it going? Hanging in, hanging in. Thanks for coming down. Yeah, uh, why did you want me to come over anyways? Well, as you know, it's Halloween season, and around these parts, things get really crazy. I'm telling you, man, Halloween is not a safe time of the year for me. You gotta help me. You gotta help me! Okay, okay, relax. I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation for all of this. So what's the plan? Well, I bolted down all the doors, locked all the windows, and we are trapped in this house. I tell you, nothing's getting to me this year. And with another person here, I feel kind of safer. Well, if you say so. But how can we pass the time? Hmm, I don't know. Wanna play Monster House on the Game Boy Advance? Licensed properties in video games have always had a somewhat frightening history. Sure, you'll have the occasional game that works well despite being based on a movie, cartoon, or comic book, but kids' animated movies tend to get lost in video game purgatory. But the Game Boy Advance had a slew of games based on existing intellectual properties that were not only kid-friendly, but the games were actually really good. Monster House on the Game Boy Advance is the perfect example of this phenomenon. A loose adaptation of the CG animated movie of the same name, Monster House was developed by Artificial Mind and Movement in 2006. This port was a much different beast than the Big Brother version on the GameCube and PS2. Heck, even the DS version was a different game. So what makes this one worth owning over the others? And is it actually really any good? First off, the core storyline is fairly simplistic. Now if you haven't seen the movie, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. The story involves three preteens, DJ, Jenny, and Chowder. Chowder, come back! <laughs> Yeah, he looks like a chowder. I knew a guy named Soup once. Good guy! They have to deal with a house that has eaten their toys for years, and the seemingly evil owner, Mr. Nebercracker, who really doesn't like anyone getting anywhere near his house. However, fate eventually brings the trio together to face off against the house by entering it, in order to prevent the house from eating worse things, like people. The movie itself is well worth a watch, especially during the Halloween season, and the game is no different. This Game Boy Advance title starts off simple enough, with the three kids preparing to put the house to sleep by sending in Sleepy Time Cough Medicine as the bait. The house takes it, and the three get pulled into the house. Now the movie actually spends very little time inside the actual house, so the Game Boy Advance version spends pretty much all of its time locked away inside this spooky location. To be honest, this house feels more like a mansion than a regular sized home. The plan gets botched pretty quickly as the house ends up devouring the kids, making them lose their flashlights, the cold syrup, and their walkie-talkies. Thankfully, the cold syrup must have busted open during the craziness, with the house being put to sleep. They eventually find their walkie-talkies, and that's when you're introduced to Skull, whose role here is very different than in the movie. Skull is an older teenager who helps you through the mansion once you retrieve your walkie-talkies. In the movie, he's more of a one-off character who declines helping the kids in favor of playing arcade games instead. Skull keeps the kids in check and on point throughout the mission, mostly interacting with you when you enter a bathroom. Monster House plays like The Legend of Zelda and Resident Evil had a demonic, creepy baby. You're exploring the mansion in Resident Evil style, with bathrooms being safe rooms that auto-refill your water guns and allowing you to save. With a top-down perspective, the game's Zelda influence is easy to appreciate, along with lots of throwbacks to classic Zelda games. I mean, just look at this room right here. That's pure Zelda goodness. Scattered all throughout the house are blueprint maps that can give you an idea of the full layout of each floor. There's a rooftop, an attic, floors 1, 2, 3, and 4, as well as basements 1, 2, and 3. The final location is the furnace, which is where we learn about the heart of the house. The trio's ultimate mission is to take down the house by destroying the heart located in the furnace. What follows is a labyrinth of chaos and carnage, but in all the right ways. 
You enter the home with some bare essential weapons and items. Each kid has a water pistol, just like in the movie, and their firepower matches their attributes as characters. DJ is the one with the most consistent spray attack, and his speed is average, whereas Chowder is the slow powerhouse, and Jenny is the quick shooter and mover. When it comes to firing your weapons, holding down the B button is recommended to make use of a faster shot with Jenny and DJ and a charge shot with chowder. Your guns can be leveled up as you move throughout the house, and you can find upgrades that allow for further distance in shooting, as well as quicker recharge rates and stronger blasts. Trying to figure out which kid should be used where is part of what makes the combat so interesting here. While your characters have different methods of attack, they all can be utilized the same way regarding the combat travel mechanics. Holding down the R button allows your characters to strafe when shooting, as well as back up and move forward without breaking the location they are firing upon. This feature was essential in this kind of game, which really does put a big focus on trying to escape from enemies' grasp in order to take them down, so movement is really important. I'm glad it's included here, though it will require a bit of adjustment to using it initially, it does pay off in the long run. Each character you play as gets a different set of secondary devices that each have their own purpose. DJ uses a camera to stun foes, giving you the ability to attack them for a brief moment without them moving. He also gets a brass key, which is used to open brass doors. I thought this was odd though. Shouldn't anybody be able to use that as a separate item? Jenny gets a slingshot like the ones she used in the movie, allowing her to open certain doors. She also gets a trash can, which lets her pass by certain enemies undetected. Chowder gets water balloons to take down fireplaces that have hidden switches or paths, and a bottle of cough medicine, which allows you to cool down overheating heaters. And of course, these are all refillable items depending on item drops or pot smashes. Each kid also has different abilities, with DJ being able to climb high places, Chowder being able to push bookcases and heavier items, and Jenny can slink through small spaces and tunnels. This may put you in a tough spot though, as you won't be able to switch between the other kids with the L button until you get access to a room that you can let them all into. Most of your time in the house will be spent randomly exploring whatever doors will actually open for you. The greenish doors will open with the press of the R button, but be careful, as sometimes the doors can end up being fake doors that will attack you. However, destroying them with your pistols will occasionally reveal entry points. Going into the map screen will also show you which doors are false and which lead to actual entrances, which is a really smart touch. Monster House keeps you on your toes at all times with both combat and puzzles. Most puzzles involve the characters moving statues or blocks in a specific pattern to unlock entrance into the next room, or to find hidden keys to lock doors. Busting open pots with your guns or by picking them up with the R button and throwing them Zelda style may also uncover keys, power-ups, or health. Your health bar is at the top of the screen, represented by small, reddish circles. If even one character loses all of these, it's game over, and the kids are thrown out of the house. But what's weird is that the dialogue here makes it seem like they're going back in willingly, despite the game just allowing you to pick up from where you last saved. It's just kind of an awkward and frustrating way to get a game over. You know, Russ, you're looking a little pale. Have you eaten? Not since this morning, since I had a bowl of Lucky Flakes. What in the holy hell are Lucky Flakes? <laughs> well, that's when you take all the bran out of Raisin Bran and mix it with the cereal pieces of Lucky Charms. What do you do with the marshmallows and the raisins? Well, you make Spooky Mix. What? I call it Spooky Mix. It's half raisins, half marshmallows. How is that spooky? Hey, don't you judge me, man. Okay, you're clearly losing it. You have strange taste, my friend. Here. Have some of the meal that I prepared for you. It's brie with blueberries, raspberry puree, and butter slices. I know it's kind of a weird meal, but it is Halloween. I gotta go to the little girl's room. I'll be right back. What is this? Expects me to eat this? I'm just gonna order Domino's.
Luckily, health can be refilled thanks to plenty of little candies that are hidden in pots. Or these can be received via an item drop by defeating a wide variety of enemies such as haunted chairs, bugs, floor monsters, and more. The enemies really pop up out of nowhere sometimes, with the game giving me a bit of a survival horror vibe. Because of the nature of their aggressive attacks, enemies can gang up on you, and they basically hang on your sprite as you try to escape, barely leaving you any room to get away. There's an interesting combat mechanic involving dashing which will help create distance between you and the enemy. Though you can't attack and dash at the same time, which is my biggest gripe about using Chowder specifically, as he tends to take forever to escape the clutches of the enemies. In order to enable the dash, you have to double tap the direction you're pointed in. I kind of wish they'd map the dash to an actual button to make it easier to press. I almost exclusively use Jenny and DJ due to them being faster to move, and with firepower that's not as strong, but much quicker. Though I will admit when Chowder gets his ultimate upgrades, he's much more manageable. Along with the health pickups, water can be refilled either in the bathrooms or by picking up item drops for the water. And water tanks can be found in treasure chests, allowing you to refill if you can't make it back to a save room. Now initially, you'll find yourself dying quite a bit as your health is pretty low. For grabbing the Super Peppermint candies, give each character an extra health bubble, no matter who grabs the power-up. While I felt that the difficulty was high, it felt fair, and when I died, I knew it was my fault, with a few rare exceptions, like this spot, where I got caught in the basement sewers while an enemy was attacking me, preventing me from getting back to land. As the game progresses, the enemies get tougher and faster, so it helps to be on your toes. This may be in in theory a kids game, but it definitely has the hardcore game player in mind when they made it this challenging. Hey Russ, what you doing? Ah, I was just looking at your Metroid painting here. Really cool stuff! Thanks, you know, Square Painter does some really amazing work. The accuracy is like downright spooky. Wow, you weren't kidding! There's a big focus on encounter-based combat that requires the player to memorize the layout of the rooms and remember different parts of the locations. In addition to the staircases spread throughout the house that leads between the floors, there's also an elevator that can eventually be activated, making your journey between floors much more manageable. However, the developers never put any kind of indicator on the elevator room on each floor, leaving players to guess where they think the elevator is and making them go on a wild goose chase to figure out how to access it. Putting an E on the room on the map the same way they signified the save rooms with an S would have made this a much more pleasurable experience when it came to traveling. Speaking of save rooms, one of the reasons why I feel that this game is really Resident Evil is because of those damn save rooms. They got particularly stingy with them, which made balancing when and who to fight a more difficult decision. If you do happen to run out of ammo on your guns, you can use a stunted shot, which puts out at a much slower rate, allowing you to not be completely helpful helpless. I'm glad that this was thrown in, as there were plenty of times I ran out of juice. Candy bars and soda are also available as the health power-ups in the game outside of the individual candy drops, though you can only max out at four total, meaning you can mix and match, but if you find one and your health refills are full, you lose the one you find in the chest, which is unfair. They should have given an option to use it on one of your teammates or yourself right then and there so it doesn't go to waste. The visuals in this game are pretty solid for a title based on a movie license. You can tell the developers took their time with everything, and while there wasn't anything that was mind-blowing visually, it inhabits the dark, mysterious, dreary look really well. In particular, I loved walking around with just my flashlight on, completely in the dark, with bad guys jumping out at me. It definitely made me jump a few times. I also think the characters look like their movie counterparts, so they did a solid job with adapting the property. I love the music in this game. Created by Manfred Linsner of audio company Shinen, the game's sound is surprisingly clear for a Game Boy Advance title, with haunting yet simplistic piano tracks that sound right out of a horror movie, and tracks will start and stop on a dime depending on which floor you enter, which can help with the memorization of the layout between floors. Violin strings are piercing, percussion is grindy, and horns blare out into the night. It's as memorable as it is eerie. There are a few boss fights in this game, 
but I felt that the main meat of this journey was involving the discovery aspect of the mansion. While the boss and enemy variety isn't the greatest, I still had a lot of fun solving puzzles, moving between floors, and scavenging for materials and power-ups. There's also these toys that you can collect, which are hidden, that you can reclaim for added replay value. So I guess the question is, is Monster House the best survival horror game on the Game Boy Advance? Yeah, I'd say so. It's nice to see a company utilize an IP the right way, instead of lazily going after a quick cash grab. And with Halloween right around the corner, it's easy to find this one for a super cheap price and dive into a deep game that respects both kids and hardcore gamers' tastes alike. Still not enough for you? If you beat the game, you can unlock Thou Art Dead, a playable version of the arcade game featured in the movie that Skull is playing. It's a Castlevania meets Ghosts and Goblins style game. Awesome! What's wrong, Russ? You seem off tonight. Everything okay? Dude, I hate to say it, but I think our house is haunted, man. You think so? Totally. I mean, there's clearly no such things as ghosts. There's gotta be someone else doing this. I think I know. You! Whoa! Well, you didn't review a Castlevania game this year. How am I supposed to make an appearance without you reviewing a Belmont-based adventure? You know, he's got a good point. Oh, Domino's is here. Sweet. Perfect. Fresh meat. No, no, no! Thank you to the following patrons. Your support means the world to me. Want more Dude You Haven't Played This Game? Make sure to stay subscribed to the channel and check out these videos enclosed below. As always, thanks for watching.